Welcome to episode number 240 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, and public relations and communications professionals. We are recording live on YouTube on August 24, 2018. A lot of things to talk about this week, including Alice in Instagram, spam best practice, Google shortwave, Facebook's reputation algorithms, Word pictures, patio pizza, conference gifs, not gifs, pizza apologies, MacBook amateur, creepy 3D cartoons, and a lot, lot more. BL kicks it off with best story of the week. BL, what was the best story of the week? Well, as you know, I'm a book lover, and so I'm thrilled with the idea that the New York Public Library and the New York City Agency called Mother are teaming up to bring classic novels to Instagram. And uh, this is from an Adweek story by Shannon Miller, and um, it started this past week with just one story, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and they're going to bring some of literature's most renowned titles to life. Uh, via the Instagram stories function. And uh, you get to click through visuals and then read from the novels. And they also have tapped a lot of influential artists to help bring classic storytelling into modern design elements. And so for the first, and they're called Insta novels. And then for the first one, you can digitally flip through Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, illustrated by animator Magaz. And then in the coming months, there'll be two other Insta novels, The Yellow Wallpaper, a short story by Charlotte Perkins Skillman, and that'll be illustrated by Buck Design. And then The Metamorphosis, this is great, a novella by Franz Kafka, Kafka illustrated by Cesar Pelizer. They're um, subtly interactive and they use functions that you will be familiar with if you use Instagram, but they're also introducing some new ways to um, interact with uh, stories that you may not have tried before. So um, the New York Public Library Instagram account uh, is one to look for. And then um, there's also an iOS and Android app that you can use for borrowing if you want to read more books, for borrowing and reading books. So uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Very cool. It makes Isn't me cool? think it makes me think of the uh, remember iOS uh, or the uh, Apple um, interactive books um, that were all the rage of I don't know several years ago. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah they're very cool. I don't know why they didn't take off because because uh, it may be the cost of doing them might have been part of it. But uh, I I'll think do... these will though because you know people are ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a that's a cool um, analog to digital story. I have a digital to analog story for you. Uh, this is uh, this is an example of how to do. Well, a month ago, I started getting spam emails, as we all do, and I get a ton of them. And so um, these were like the subject line was, uh, "Has your gift arrived? Uh, did you get the treat we sent you?" And I'm like, you know, just delete, delete, spam, delete, right. spam, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I kept deleting them. Uh, I didn't recognize the name, so I wasn't going to pay attention to it. Finally, I'm told at the office there's a package for me in the refrigerator. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I wasn't expecting a package. Second of all, in the refrigerator? What's that all about? So you got my interest, obviously. I go and I open it up, and it is a gift basket from Sherry's Gourmet, that has uh, chocolate-covered cherries and chocolate-covered blueberries, white chocolate pretzels, sea salt caramel popcorn. Oh, I'll be right it's probably over. Six, yeah, <laughs> probably a sixty to hundred dollar gift basket, right? So, I'll, I don't know who sent it to me, but in the basket they have a brochure for Stack Adapt. Here's the brochure, and it is yeah, a typical brochure, right? Stack Adapt is, if you haven't heard of them, an advertising network. Uh, everyone in the office is asking about the gift basket, of course, right? Uh, so everybody in the office learns about Stack Adapt. Very smart. Uh, now I feel obliged to check them out, right? Because they sent me this, this expensive gift, gift basket. So I visit their site and learn that they are a self-service native ad network. Um, 
We go back and check the emails, uh, contact them to arrange demo. Uh, we are actually in the middle of uh, uh, budget planning for one of our clients, and uh, native advertising is one of the tactics that we're recommending. So obviously, I get a demo, I create an account, build an audience within their platform. They help me price out a budget. Uh, it is. It looks pretty cool. It is self-serve, so you're paying. Basically, it's it's AdWords, but for native native advertising. Uh, so you're only paying for what you uh, what you uh, what you get. Um, I no doubt we're going to use them. Uh, but that that is how you do spam. <laughs> well, you know that reminds me of back in the days when I had a PR firm, and back in the days when you could go up to pretty much anybody's office. I used to send people around, like you know, with with things like uh, we'd send daffodils to editors in the spring, and we and I'd have people who you know we'd give them a map, and they'd go from AP to the New York Times to here to there, to, you know, yeah. just to be nice to people. But of course, you can't do that anymore because you have to have four forms of identification and an appointment before you go see anybody. But we would go to the newsrooms at night because anybody could walk in then and nobody had anything to do. So we could talk to them. You know, Can't do that now. But what a clever thing to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How could you not love anybody who sends you food? Exactly. <laughs> Especially chocolate. I love them. <laughs> so, um, you know, the ascendancy of podcasting, it continues. And uh, Google is, uh, according to uh, Russell Brandom at The Verge, is developing an experimental podcast app. And uh, so within Google, they've been in their lab, I guess, uh, developing this app for discovering and playing podcasts. It's called Shortwave. And it was revealed by a trademark filing, which describes it as allowing users to search, access, and play digital audio files and to share links to audio files. It is so cool. So um, the uh, spokesperson from there said, uh, one of the many projects we're working on within Area 120, which is Google's <laughs> experimental place, is Shortwave, which helps users discover and consume spoken word audio in new ways. Like other projects within Area 120, it's a very early experiment, and there aren't many details to share right now. You got to take a look at Area 120. It's very cool. Very cool. Well, I can't wait to see it. Um, the, the, that is something that I'm emphasizing with everybody I talk to, uh, is audio is the, next, is the next frontier, especially with Google. Uh, getting smart about indexing audio and understanding content of audio, this is another example of, of where they're going. So soon enough, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be creating a lot more audio content than, than people are right now. So You know, when I interviewed Mitch Joel, he compared this to the early 90s when firms were saying, website, do we need a website? And now some of them are going, podcast, do we need a podcast? Yes, you do. And now's the time to start it. You know, this is, this is the time when you can still get attention for your podcast. It's going to get harder as time goes on. Yeah. Well, speaking of attention, uh, there are a couple of algorithm uh, points of interest in the news, uh, which have have uh, have a impact on uh, on attention of content. This is from a Washington Post article by Elizabeth Elizabeth Dwoskin, uh, who uh, reports that Facebook is assigning a trust score to its users. So this is a, this is a score between zero and one that apparently is not meant to be an absolute indicator of a person's credibility. But if you think about it, if it's between zero and one, that's binary. So that usually means yes or no. So if they're assigning a trust score, you either are trustworthy or you're not. Like if them. It's a, if, it's, <laughs> if it's between or zero. This is an attempt to get on the, the, the fake news and the, and the problems that are besetting uh, Facebook. Uh, so, so I salute them for trying to, trying to do something. But uh, it is apparently one measurement among thousands that are uh, of new behavioral clues that Facebook is taking into account. Um, so think about what those signals could be when you think about how people use Facebook. It could be the degree to which a user posts links to sites that traffic in fake news, right? Fake news, right? It could be the degree to which a user engages with fake news, conspiratorial or, or hateful content. It could be groups that a user has joined that are devoted to conspiracy theories, for example. Could be a preponderance of untrustworthy people within a user's network. So those are all a bunch of signals that you'd think that Facebook would be paying attention to with regard to this. Uh, Facebook is also monitoring, monitoring 
uh, which users have a prop propensity to flag content as problematic uh, if the if the publishers are considered trustworthy trustworthy by other users. So these are people who are flagging content that's bad, but uh, other users consider it trustworthy, right? Twitter, they, the article cites, has uh, factors that factors that factor in the behavior of other accounts in a person's network as a risk factor to determine whether a person's tweet should be spread. Uh, so here's an example. If someone gives, a fee gives feedback that an article is false and the article is confirmed as false by a fact checker, then Facebook might weigh that person's future false news feedback more than someone who indiscriminately provides false news feedback on lots of articles, including ones that end up to be rated as true. So this is part of the political dialogue. People don't like something that don't like an article that is disagreed that is is false. Um, so uh, one quote by Claire Wordle, uh, who's a director of First Draft, uh, not knowing how Facebook is judging what makes us uncomfortable, um, but uh, the irony is that they can't tell us how they're judging us, because if they do, the algorithms will be game. So that is the nature of the beast. Uh, that's why faith, That's why Google doesn't tell you how they rank red websites. Uh, Facebook can't do it, or people are going to game their algorithm too. But uh, an interesting development, nevertheless. Well, I posted uh, yesterday, I posted a four-minute video interview with J.T. Kostman, who's one of the leading experts on applied artificial intelligence and data science. And the question I asked him in that excerpt from a longer interview was, do Facebook, Google, YouTube, et al. have enough data to be able to tell what's fake and what's not, to be able to stop the Russian interference or other foreign government interference? And he said, of course they do. You know, it's a financial decision. They are, he describes them as parasitic um, platforms that basically republish other people, our content, which we give them the right to do because they help us to spread it. And, you know, it's against their financial model to get rid of any of the people who are contributing content. So, you know, yeah, that sounds really nice. But, you know, the bottom line is they already know who's fake and who's not. And they already know who's interfering in the election and who's not. And it's to their credit that this week, both Facebook and Twitter announced that they were getting rid of hundreds or was it thousands of accounts that they were sure, and Microsoft too, were going to interfere in the election. But, you know, I have mixed feelings about that one. That's a little bit black mirror to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I do think um, there's lots to be criticized, critis critical about Facebook, obviously. Um, but they are they are doing things that are against their financial interests right now because they have, I mean, as somebody who does a lot of Facebook advertising, they have dramatically reduced the, num the, the ability to target people. So they're taking away a whole host of data that you used to be able to very narrowly define who you want to target, which is a goldmine for, for target market, for advertisers and marketers. We want to reach a very narrow audience and, uh, and know exactly who we're targeting. Uh, to be as relevant as possible to a given audience, um, but we can't do that anymore because the data isn't there. So, uh, so and it's a, it, it is actually beneficial to the recipient of that message because they're getting uh, relevant relevant ads. But at the same time, it's been abused, and that's why they're they're pulling back the. So they're doing stuff that is against their financial interests. Um, they have to, you know, I mean, it, they really have to, uh, That that's clear. And I, and I believe, honestly, I believe that Mark Zuckerberg wants to do the right thing and just really kind of doesn't know where to start because he's built this thing that's so colossal. But, you know, I think sooner or later, the investors are going to want to get rid of him. We'll see. I got one more on the uh, on the uh, on the reputation thing. This is a different part uh, of the uh, the reputation scoring by Facebook, but it has to do with their advertising and uh, some things I didn't actually uh, uh, under know about until I I heard a podcast, a social media examiner's podcast by Michael Stelzner, who interviewed uh, 
uh, his guest, Ralph Burns, who is a Facebook ads e expert. And uh, he was talking about the, the reputation score that Facebook has for its ads, for its advertising. Just as Google has quality scores for their search advertising, Facebook has a reputation score for its ads. So they have something called estimated action rate. And it considers several factors like uh, likes of a piece of uh, content for an ad, uh, shares of an ad, comments on an ad, video views, clicks to your website or back to the page, uh, hiding your ad or negative factors in the ad algorithm, unliking your page after viewing an ad. Uh, so these are different factors that contribute to the viewability or the, the, uh, the uh, reach of your ad. So these are aggregated into a relevance score. Uh, which advertisers you can see if you do Facebook advertising, you'll have a relevance score among your metrics. It's a rating of one to 10 to tell you how well your target audience is responding to your ad. The um, estimated action rate also looks at, and these are the, this is what I didn't realize, the ad set. So when you create Facebook advertising, you have a campaign. Within that is an ad set. Within the ad set is a bunch of ads. So it looks at the, uh, the uh, performance overall of the ad set, but also the campaign and your account history. So your Facebook page, regardless of advertising. An example is if your Facebook page was hacked and used for ill uh, it can damage your ads reputation. But your Facebook page alone, if you foster engagement on the page, if you're attentive to people's comments and, and reply to their comments, if users like your content and share your content, if your product is well matched, well matched the markets you're targeting, uh, your CPA will, will decrease and it'll help you get more engagement. So actually uh, where I have thought that the Facebook page was something you needed just for advertising, the engagement on the page itself can contribute to the uh, to the effectiveness uh, effectiveness of your advertising. So well, that a, makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, yeah. that's what Facebook should be about. No. You know, have you ever had it happen to a client where uh, Facebook decides that you should change your category? I've had that happen a couple of times to clients. Like they decide that you're a service instead of a uh, whatever you said you were, and you have to tell them, no, we're not. Have you ever had that? It's very interesting. I have not. That is interesting. Yeah, they did that to a nonprofit client that I had. I thought that was very interesting. odd. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, this is, um, again, artificial intelligence, and this is from um, – uh, inside AI and also from Motherboard. And uh, Inside AI reported on a system called ATTNGAN, I don't know how to pronounce that, that generates images based on text input. So they found a link that lets you try it for yourself. And uh, so you type a word or a description into it and it produces an image. Um, it's supposed to visualize text-based captions, but it's not really good at it. Like if you type in beautiful woman, you get a really scary looking thing. It's okay with things like cat. Um, so I, I guess to be fair, they trained it to make specific data sets like birds and they can produce really nice images of birds. But when they get to more diverse images, they're not there yet. But it's a very interesting idea and you should try it as fun to play with. I think you say, at at again attention a t t n at a t t n g a n at that's attention g n attention g n attention g n uh, i don't know but anyway something. the link will be there and take a look it's fun to play with interesting those i so a, a lot of these ai projects put that stuff out into the other so that they can gather a lot of data so that their their systems can learn right sure so that's, that makes total like sense that is. but it makes also sense that they can easily reproduce a cat because there's a zillion cat videos already out in the, in the world. Probably the same thing with birds as well. Maybe well, there's birds. a zillion beautiful women too, you know. Yeah, but beauty, I mean, as we've discussed in a previous episode, the beauty.ai uh, didn't really work so well because it was just a data set of European women. So no people of color in that beauty. And we know that there are beautiful people of color. So sure yeah, are. it all depends on the data set. <laughs> so this brings us to bad news. No, no, no. We got plenty we more, more good, good news. news. Oh, I don't have more good news. So <laughs> make me happy. I will make you happy. Just pay attention in a moment. Uh, this is from an Adweek article by David uh, Giantazio. 
uh, who reports on Boston Pizza, which is strangely a Canadian chain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, they teamed with their Toronto agency, John Street, and created a clever marketing campaign inside the pizza box. Uh, you know the little white uh, thing that they stick in the middle of your pizza to keep yeah, to the keep it lid from, the, from the box. crushing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so think of that, and it's got three legs. And what they did was put a couple of miniature white chairs around the around the <laughs> way, around that thing. Uh, it, it's and it, it's got it's the pizza table, and it's designed as as I said to keep the lid the lid from smashing into your pizza. Um, but they did that because, according to client senior director of marketing, Andrian Fu Fuoco, patio season is a big deal for Canadians. Uh, whatever patio season, but apparently there's a patio season in Canada. Uh, this was all about creating something fun that was part of our larger patio season initiative. Ultimately, we found a way to bring together the two things we we're passionate about, patios and pizza. Uh, so the chairs were 3D printed using food safe materials. I don't know what that is, but safe for food. Uh, there were a limited number that were delivered to uh, with orders uh, uh, from select Boston pizza locations. The pizzeria previously had designed a pizza box for eating in bed, which you <laughs> what was unfold, that? and it, it creates basically a, a table for you to eat your pizza on while you're in bed. So uh, have a book holder. <laughs> we'll put, we'll put, we'll we have to ask our Canadian friends what patio, what is it, patio, well, patio season? season? Patio yeah. season. I assume it, that that's the time when it's not freezing cold in Canada you, know you can what? sit on your patio. We have that in Minnesota. I didn't realize that, but yeah, it's it's every, all restaurants need patios now or need need an outdoor thing because we have to be outdoors because it's winter. <laughs> Is that common? Uh -huh. The farmer's almanac, by the way, seems to be saying that it'll be a warm winter. We'll see. Well, I mean, I think we can expect warmer and warmer winters every every year. So, unfortunately, um, another good one. So, I went to a conference, Digital Summit. Uh, it is held in cities throughout the United States, and uh, Minneapolis was this past week. Uh, two day conference, fantastic, a lot of good stuff. Uh, local, national uh, people at the conference uh, presenting. Uh, the keynotes included a woman from Air Airbnb and the co-founder of The Onion. Um, but uh, my takeaway from that for this podcast was Alight Analytics, a brand you may not have heard of. You probably haven't heard of because I hadn't heard of them. Uh, but they did. Uh, they just rocked on Twitter for marketing at a conference. Uh, so they had a speaker there uh, at the conference uh, who was an analytics expert, obviously. And throughout the conference, they were tweeting. And it, I'm going to tell you some of it, give you a, a, a selection of their tweets uh, for how they, they, they're they rocking with the GIFs, actually. The GIFs were fantastic. Uh, so their initial tweet before the conference started, they're teasing, our team is headed to the Twin Cities for Digital Summit Minneapolis. What should we check out while we're in town? So they're asking people who, there is a predictable uh, conversation that goes on online around conferences. People talk about the conference before they go to the conference. They talk about conference while they're at the conference. And then they talk about the conference after they've gone to the conference. So they're taking advantage of that dynamic and asking uh, what they should do. Right, so that's a good thing. They're they're listing, they're generating awareness. Then the day of the conference, the first day of the conference, they tweet, "Good morning, uh, DS Minneapolis. It's a beautiful day to learn about marketing analytics. Be sure to swing by the analytics booth and say hello." And they include the link or uh, a, a GIF of Johnny Bravo with the with a with a uh, caption that said, "It's a beautiful day, but not as beautiful as me." And <laughs> They followed that up with uh, "Hey DS Minneapolis." All cool. All the cool people are headed to stage three to hear Matt Hertig, who is their expert speaker, talk marketing analytics in thirty minutes. Uh, want to see you there? And then they had a gif of dan a dancing parade of characters from The Office. So. Uh, what they did with the gifts is they're catching your attention while you're scrolling through the feed of seeing what people are saying about the conference, right? And, ah, oh, there's an office gif. I'm going to pay attention to it. So you pay attention to it, and they're trying to draw people in to go to uh, 
go to their guys uh their guys so did uh, you go session i didn't actually go to that one there's some good ones but i didn't go <laughs> yeah. to that one. um like what you heard at matt hertig's talk so after he's done talking they, they're tweeting uh ds minneapolis then stop at the L, uh at, at the booth to learn more marketing analytics and then they had a uh, a gif of andy samberg yelling cool beans very good and then finally uh what it feels like when your marketing Data is out of control, DS Minneapolis. We can help. Stop by the uh, Alight Analytics booth today. And they had a GIF of a forklift knocking down a row of shelves in a warehouse, which is exact, exactly the emotion you have, have when your data is out of control. So uh, they did this throughout the day. They had a bunch more. And it was using the emotional trigger and the visual to grab your attention and uh, and and make you smile, which brought you in. The only the only downside of that is I actually went through the booze twice, maybe three. You never found them. You didn't find their booth. I didn't find their booth. I was <laughs> I wanted to talk to them and compliment them on their on their Twitter game and say that I was going to use it in the in the in the podcast, but uh, yeah, I couldn't find them. That's very funny. <laughs> so that brings us to bad news, yeah? Yeah, it does. Well, you know, Papa John's Pizza has been creating around itself a terrible uh, series of stories. So um, as you probably remember, the founder, John Schnatter, uh, he's the former CEO. Uh, he unfortunately was at a shareholders meeting, I guess it was, and he, or in a, a call, and he used a racist, he said some racist things, and he was made to resign from the company that he started. And uh, so he couldn't leave that alone. He uh, started a website called Save Papa John's, and apparently I guess he wants to gain sympathy after he had to leave his own company. And he includes all the court filings that have gone back and forth and press releases and letters. And he says he misses and he loves the company and he really you know, feels bad that, that he made this mistake, but my goodness, people make mistakes. And so, okay, everybody really jumped on him and derided him. And, and so not content to let Schnatner go unchallenged, Papa John's new CEO, whose name is Steve Ritchie, <laughs> issued this new core value statement for the company on Twitter with this really weird video. It's had 156,000 views since three this afternoon. And it's filled with, it's so strange. It's filled with disappointed tweets about the company and, um, it, you know, really terrible things that people said. And then it says, thank you for your anger. Then they cross out anger. Thank you for your criticism. Cross out anger. I mean, cross out criticism. And then, you know, it's typed. And then they cross out the word. And so then after they cross out criticism, they say, thank you for your honesty. It's making us better. But that's not the end. That's followed by a tweet that says, you definitely lost a long time fan, SMH shaking my head, hoping you guys go do better going forward. And that's the end. It's so strange. You just like, you end up shaking your head going, what? <laughs> it's very strange. I'll put it in the show notes. I mean, it's like this feud that is apparently going to keep going on between them. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to shut up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, a converse relation uh, uh, example of that, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, is the, uh, the Airbnb uh, speaker at the conference that I went to uh, played a video uh, of their response to the uh, trouble that they got in because there were Airbnb members who were, uh, who were being discriminatory and not letting uh, people of color uh, rent their rent their their available space, and they responded by creating a video that addressed it first, you know, up front and said, you know, this is not who we are, uh, and 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 uh, it, it, I'll see, we'll see if we can find the video online because she showed it on, at the at the conference, but uh, it was very well done, and they continue to, I mean, it's it's something that is an ongoing campaign for them, so uh, it is in their core values. They, they basically, anybody who signs up for Airbnb accepts this statement of values 
uh, before they can, you know, they can now use, they use do. The they didn't know. Well, I mean, you know, I you gotta. People don't think about how uh, we're, we're we are now facing the fact that people are using these platforms for ill, and the people who started them. I mean, I, I'm sure that they didn't think about it. Maybe they should have. Well, of course they should have. I mean, this is no. not a new issue. But, you know, Airbnb has come in for a lot of criticism that I think has been unfounded. I mean, a lot of people in New York City, for example, are able to stay in their apartments because they're able to get extra income by renting them out through Airbnb. And, you know, but the landlords are, are and the neighbors are like, well, you can't make a hotel out of where we live. And so there, there have been issues in cities. But, you know, people I know who have country houses, they rent them out when they're not there. They rent them out, you know, to help pay the mortgage on their houses. I mean, it, it helps a lot of people to be able to do that. And it helps a lot of people to be able to stay in the nice homes of other people. So they've taken a lot of heat that is a little bit unfair. But, you know, there's two sides to the story. Yeah, well, the reason I brought it up is it seemed to me just off the top of my head that uh, that Papa John's may have gotten the idea from Airb uh, what Airbnb did. But if it's a feud between, yeah, that's not going to work. Just a feud. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It really is. Yeah. So <laughs> I have a I have a mini rant. Uh, my worst is is my own experience with my MacBook Pro keyboard. Oh my God! It's oh, horrible. everyone hates them. Oh my! But it, for a different reason. I I read about it, and it's like the 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 criticisms that I've read online are not the criticisms that I have. Uh, I have a MacBook Air personally, and I just I had the MacBook Air at work, and then I just got a MacBook Pro to replace it. And what I can't stand about it is the keyboard. It's it's not the criticism that people have online, which is like they 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 stick or something. Mine is that the placement of it. I have never made so many typos, and I'm an ex excellent art, uh, a typist. I can type without looking at the keys, pretty flawlessly. Uh, but I have never made so many typos since using this damn MacBook Pro keyboard. That I that it's just it's horribly unproductive. It's a disa disaster of a design of a keyboard. It's also an ergonomic disaster. I will yeah. tell you that. Um, and I use a uh, a Kinesis Advantage Two ergonomic keyboard and and a MacBook Pro because I have had carpal tunnel issues. And if you haven't had them yet with your Apple keyboard, you will. <laughs> It's a terrible keyboard. I highly recommend you suggest you get yourself a different keyboard and hook it on up. I think that's that's an excellent suggestion. I will make uh, make IT pay for it too because oh, I absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the Kinesis is great. You know, no more carpal tunnel, no more issues with. I mean, the whole thing. I I can put I can give you a link to it. It's fabulous. I wrote a whole post about it because I was literally on disability because of being crippled by computers way back at the beginning because there was nothing ergonomic about them at that point. So I know a lot about that stuff. And the Apple keyboard, it's the pits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've gone through the carpal tunnel too. That's no fun at nasty, all. Nasty, nasty. There was a time when I had to like attach strings to my cabinets and open them with my teeth. I kid you yeah. not. You know, it was bad news. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> better, better worse news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. this is what's wrong with the internet. Okay, this is from a, a Vice story by Beckett Mufson that I came upon through Casey Newton, and this is about a security guard who filmed all his farts for six months, and he went viral, and then he got fired. Big surprise there, right? So um, he is a security guard at a Florida hospital, and he spent the last six months publicly logging his really major farts on Instagram, where he's known as, uh, what's his name on Instagram? Paul Flart, where he has 59,000 <laughs> followers, by the way. I was thinking he was going to be called the Fart King, but Paul Flart is better. I have Paul to Paul Flart, yep, 59,000 <laughs> followers. And um, he, he, <laughs> and he apparently got a whole whole bunch. But but anyway, um, he you know, he's like a stinky offshoot of the mall cop, Paul Blart. Right. So on Tuesday, he put up a YouTube uh, compilation of his most memorable ass clappers, and he got over a million views with 5.8 thousand thumbs up since 
Tuesday, since Wednesday, and uh, that was after he got to the top of Reddit's uh, video forum, and then he got fired, and so he live streamed his firing, and uh, as a result of that video, he has followers from all over the world. So he told Vice, he said, it transcends all languages. There's no translation necessary. It's just funny. So when you look at the YouTube comments, you know, most of the people are like, they say that, you know, it's just so disgusting. But by the end of it, they were falling on the floor laughing, which was not my response. But um, somebody said it's like listening to a romantic audio book narrated by Terrence and Philip from South Park. <laughs> So now so, that he's been fired, he has a Patreon where he says, I'm Paul Flart. I make fart videos on Instagram for the joy and happiness of all who see them. <laughs> my, goal is, <laughs> my goal is to be the first person to make a living off farting. <laughs> fired from my job in a public manner. He has 22 <laughs> Patreons so far. Now, this is reminiscent of an 18th century French celebrity who was named Le Petomain, which is French for the farter. And this man would come out on stage and he would fart musically, like he could fart, you know, like, uh, what is the French anthem? I can't think of the, the title, you know, or uh, he, he could fart a song and he had a cane and he would come out and he would bend over and he would fart with a microphone. And, and there was a book about him. And in <laughs> my first job, when you're my boss, gave out that book for Christmas presents. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be the first person to make a living for farting. So <laughs> my first question was, what's there to see with the fart? And then Oh, it's nothing. It's his face. It's a, it's a video of him. Of his face. So of his face while he farts. Yeah. A very close up of his face. He was going to light his farts on fire or something so there'd be a visual. No, no, it's just his face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, got this, this, you know, big face, chubby guy. And I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. It's absolutely, it's what's wrong with the internet that a million people are laughing at it's this. It's what's thing. right with the internet. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's the difference between you and me. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Uh, so that's my news. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I have to tell How the story. How are going to follow that? Yeah. I am not going to follow that. I'm just going to go right into my next core story. <laughs> this is a guy named Miguel Vasquez, who is a graphic artist. Um, and he has he's a 3D graphic artist, so he uses 3D modeling software. And he has been using his uh, modeling software to create realistic and very disturbing versions of popular cartoon characters. So we'll include these in the show notes. I can't describe them yet. Oh, you have to see yeah. them. Uh, yeah. But among them are Homer Simpson, SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, Mike from uh, from Monsters, Inc., and Phineas and Ferb. And it is insanely accurate and at the same time just kind of horrifying. Uh, so I was going to put this in the best, but because it's so disturbing, and put it in the worst, but we'll include those in the show notes. They uh, really were pretty awful. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings us to shiny new objects, yeah? It does indeed. What do you got? I have such a good one. Um, this is called Do Nothing for Two Minutes. And you just go there and you do absolutely nothing but listen to the sound of ocean waves for two minutes. It makes you feel so much better. I don't have the patience for that. I knew you wouldn't somehow. <laughs> but I ha I mean, can I tell you the truth? I had it on in the background while I was doing other things. <laughs> right, cheating. Cheater. <laughs> I was cheating. <laughs> but it's a good idea. It's, it's like I'm going to meditate every day, you know, and, and, and sometimes I do. Yeah, I'm going to uh, <laughs> aspire to meditate every day. I aspire um, to meditate too. <laughs> And I so have a my, little alarm that reminds me, but you know, I'm I'm adept at not doing you it. Just hit the snooze all the time. Um, <laughs> an evil thing, don't you think? No, yeah, that's great. Uh, mine is a cool app called Otter. It's Otter.ai. It is voice transcription. It's a live recording device. Basically, it's meant to be a note-taking app, 
And so you, uh, you, it's an app. You, if you're sitting in a meeting, hit record, and it does a live audio recording as well as real-time transcription. So I tried it on a couple of TV commercials and on a political talk show. It was pretty accurate. Uh, you need to clean it up a bit, so you got to add some punctuation. But for the most part, really good. Uh, I'd say like 85, 90% accuracy. Wow. Uh, it is instantaneous, and it's free for 60 minutes per month. comes in an iOS and Android. The premium version is $9.99 a month for uh, 6,000 minutes a month. Uh, there, however, is no upload feature. So I was going to, ah, we can use this for transcribing podcasts, but I can't upload the uh, upload uh, a file to it, so it won't do it that way. But I did just set the app to my phone down in front of the TV, and it picked it up perfectly and and, and transcribed in real time. So we could probably do it that way as well. But uh, I very have cool. one too. I have Tape a Call, uh, which you can use with your phone for taping interviews and. Uh, um, in, you know, so you don't have to take notes while you're talking to somebody and you can record the calls you're already on or calls that you're about to make. And then when you're done, the recordings show up instantly and you can share or save them. And that one's $24.99 a year, but well worth it if you, you know, if you do interviews a lot, which I do on the phone and um, you want to make sure that you're being accurate. It's really an excellent tool. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, my other one is uh, MailChimp, a new feature of MailChimp. MailChimp has added tags. So tags are taking the place of static segments in MailChimp. If you use MailChimp, you can uh, create segments. So you can be dynamic and every, anybody meets a, 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 um, a requirement for your segment, they'll be added, but then there's static segments as well. Uh, so they will be converted, the static segments will be automatically converted to tags. Uh, we still have regular list set segments that automatically update, as I mentioned, but now you can also uh, use a uh, base of segment on tag data and tags are very flexible. So if you think about blogs, if you're not familiar with, uh, with, um, with MailChimp, but if you think about blogs, you can tag a blog post with any keyword and then you can segment all of those blog posts that have that same keyword, basically the same uh, feature for uh, emailing uh, subsets of your mailing list. So it's a, it's a cool feature. It's for you to keep track of them. Yep. Yep. And for you People to mail. Search on them. Mail. Yeah. In mail. Temp, right? Yeah. You can segment your list based on tags too. Oh, I like that. I, I, I use MailChimp. Um, I do have another one, and uh, this may be the social network that's going to replace them all. It's called Brizzly, and uh, you type in whatever you want, and it goes absolutely nowhere. It just disappears. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the world needs now. <laughs> absolutely nothing happens. All right. <laughs> so, uh, that bring us to projects. So as I said before, I, I did and will post an interview with um, JT Kosman, which was really fascinating. I did a, I have a long one and a short one. And uh, I was on a podcast the other night. I was interviewed by uh, Des Walsh, who's podcast out of Australia on leadership. So that was really an honor. And uh, he'll be uh, posting that soon. I'll put a link to it. Very cool. Can't wait for that. Fun. It was night uh, here and day there. That was fun, too. Awesome. So uh, are we doing politics this week or no? Well, yeah. Right, <laughs> go, go right ahead. It. I don't have any. You don't have any? Okay. I don't I, have I'm any. Not, I, I, I'm not going to actually talk about this because uh, I won't be able to hold it together if I do. I will just mention that there is a post, uh, a, a link, uh, a Twitter post uh, by New York's Attorney General Barbara Underwood. Uh, who law clerked for uh, Thurgood Mar Marshall, and uh, the the, ju the gist of the uh, of the video in the tweet is that during these turbulent times, she is uh, trying to emulate her her uh, mentor Thurgood Marshall by laying down a marker for a brighter future. It is a video of hope, and I'll put a link in the show notes for you to watch it. But yeah, I can't say anything more about it. Or probably lose it <laughs> you mean so, you'll cry it's yeah it's uh it's very inspiring and very very um it's something we need in these dark times 
You know, we need a lot more of that. I swear, times are dark indeed. Yep. That brings us to your daily numbers. It does indeed. And I'm going to lean in and read these because it's so small and my eyes are so poor. Uh, <laughs> but this is from Adobe, which does a uh, annual uh, survey uh, on email usage. And uh, it's a big survey, so it's a lot of good data. And um, yeah, no, I can't even read it. I'm going to pull that up to a different screen. So You're on a Mac, control plus, control plus, control plus. Uh, there we go. All right. Here we go. So um, the most appropriate communication methods uh, method for different interactions, and this is, uh, this is at work. Uh, so the first one is a status of most appropriate communication method for a status update on a project. 50% said email is the most appropriate channel for communicating that. 18% um, said face-to-face -face communication. Uh, for delivering feedback, 43% chose email as the most appropriate communication method. 30% said face-to-face. -face. Um, for a brief question, 34% said email. 21% said, what do you think, BL? Phone. Not phone, instant message. Oh, that, that would be I like use that all the time. If I just need a quick question, it is an instant message to somebody. Uh, suggesting a new approach or an idea. So this is part of a, uh, it. Some diplomacy is required for this, right? Probably. 30, 33% said uh, email. 39% said face-to-face. -face. Uh, asking for help on a big project. 28% chose email. 39% said face-to-face. 15% uh said uh phone uh alerting your bro your boss of an important issue 22 percent said email 42 percent said face to face 18 percent by phone finally quitting your job what is the most important channel for that email <laughs> 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 You're in the minority if you say that. 13% said email, 68% uh, said face-to-face, -face, and 8% said uh, said phone. There's a lot of really good data in this. We'll put a link to the uh, to the to the presentation in the show notes. Uh, but uh, email uh, email is the is is the communication channel that won't die. It 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 it. it is well, in everything that we do. So it's a lot of good data that you need to. Uh, a lot yeah. of people are replacing email with Slack in their companies. And, you know, I spend, I kid you not, like I spend two hours every other day just zapping six or 800 emails from two days. I mean, they're driving me crazy. They're just driving me crazy. And, you know, at least with Slack, you don't have that. Yeah, but everybody uses two things every, that everybody uses regardless of age or demographic, email and uh, search. And people will say, well, millennials don't e use email. Well, maybe not. Maybe when they, when they're tiny children and they're not, they're not spending anything at work. Once they, they do. once they start getting to work yeah. and every social media platform requires an email to create an account. It is, but, the you know, ties everything together. I could have a rant here about email. I mean, what makes me crazy about email is that people change the subject and don't change the heading on the email. Oh, I so you, that's, that's I, it problem. makes me insane. Yeah, it does. Them. And then you refer to something that you told me yeah. in an email that has a string of 26 yeah. things that are completely unrelated. And I don't frankly care. And it makes, it, said. makes if it you can't communicate. It makes it completely unsearchable. I agree. Oh, my God. It makes me nuts. I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah. Really? Is everybody listening to that? You got to change your freaking subject line. And the subject changes, change the subject oh, line. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that is just the worst part of the day. <laughs> so that we each got to do a rant, Dave. Right, right, right. <laughs> and I do, can I do a cute, quick one about who's sweet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let that go. Um, okay, so <laughs> their customer service, which doesn't exist. Um, this brings us to the end of episode 240 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And you're going to find links to everything we talked about and videos that we mentioned at beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 240. Uh, we hope that you will go to... Uh, 
to iTunes and subscribe to the show. We're on the web at beyondsocialmediashow.com. We're on YouTube, of course, at Beyond Social Media Show. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Uh, we are also on Google Home. Uh, is that correct? Amazon Home. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I just get this in my head. Echo. Amazon Echo, right. And Google Home, though. We're not on that. Okay. So my charming host, Dave Erickson, is on Twitter as at D Erickson. He blogs at estrategyblog.com and creativepr.com slash blog, both of which have terrific content. He's on YouTube as eStrategy. I'm BL Ackman. I blog at What's Next Blog. I'm on YouTube as What's Next Blog. Uh, my website is blackman.com and my side hustle is Funwalkers license plates for mobility devices. And we'll be back. When are we coming back, Dave? It's not next week. Not next week. We're taking the week off for uh, the holiday, Labor Day. Uh, we'll be back the following week with BL's interview, which you will definitely want to uh, want to uh, pay attention to. So we'll be back with the interview the following week, and then we're going to resume the uh, uh, regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> so we're wishing you a very wonderful end of summer holiday, hoping you're taking one. And thank you for watching tonight. Thanks for watching.